Yo, WordPress people, welcome back to the WPMRR WordPress podcast. I'm Joe. And I'm Arthur D2. <laughs> and you're listening to the WordPress Business Podcast. We are lucky enough to have uh, the infamous R2D2 on the show this week. What's going on, R2? Hey, everyone. How is it going? We are just going to go nuclear on Darth Vader. <laughs> yes, that's a, we should do that for sure. R2D2 on the show, uh, but actually R2D2 is secretly Mario Peshev. Mario is the, and make sure I'm getting this right, Mario, the CEO and founder and or co-founder of, of Devrix. Yep. I'm, I guess it's yeah, just called right. Devrix. Yep. Yeah, very cool. Um, yep. I actually have a, a very interesting R2D2 fact that we should start oh, go ahead, man. off with. As soon as you said, so obviously people listening know everyone kind of has a little fun character we start with. Uh, and uh, I've been waiting for someone to pick R2-D2 because uh, I have a fun R2-D2 fact, which is, uh, you know, at the beginning of every Star Wars movie, they have a long time ago in a galaxy far away. And most people think a long time ago means a long time ago from today. So it's like, it's very far in the past, but it's in a galaxy far away. So it's like a different human kind of civilization out there. But it's actually R2, uh, the, the concept of a, a long time ago in a galaxy far away is it's even farther in the future. And someone is telling the story of this, the Star Wars, now the nine Star Wars movies in the past, but someone's actually telling it from even farther in the future. And so who could possibly be far enough in the future that, they could say a long time ago in a galaxy far away, someone must be telling the whole story of all nine movies. And there's only one character who really is consistently through all nine movies who has the kind of capacity to remember this whole story to be able to tell it. And that character is R2-D2. So I really like that. Love it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So Mario, you have a big responsibility to uh, remember the entire history of the WordPress uh, scene. (laughs) us a long time ago yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah I, I can definitely relate to this one uh, i'm actually kind of picked art and simply because you know i've gotten lots of different jobs that i'm on android you know due to different reasons and mostly the fact that i'm working non-stop and i'm also coming up with all those snarky comments so art this was, was actually the only logical choice here uh, and your story <laughs> is actually supporting my theory so thank you a lot for that yeah, nice. There you go. Uh, and I know our listeners can't really see, but I see you've got a little dog. You got a little pup back in there in the background. Yeah, <laughs> this is uh, Mara, our community manager. I'm at the office here, and she's protecting my back, so to speak. So yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely something that not uh, not everyone can see right now. But I'm going to make sure to prepare a photo to play that later. Yeah, there nice. you go. There you go. Yeah, this is Marvin. <laughs> he is dead asleep right now, and then Oliver's right next to him. But uh, yeah, Marvin, we we say is our head of marketing. <laughs> he did hire a head of marketing, so we said like Marvin. Unfortunately, you just didn't do that great of a job as our head of marketing. So we replace you with that. Actual- <laughs> nice. We've got two mascots here on the show. <laughs> I'm going to make sure that our community manager isn't going to get a little competition over the coming year, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> nice, nice. We'll have to connect um, We'll have to connect your community manager and our head of marketing via email, and we'll have to do some partnerships together or something. So, Deverix, uh, I mean, so I know you through, I think the first time I, I ever saw some of your stuff online, I think it was a WordCamp uh, Europe talk, uh, and it was about growing Deverix, and it was about uh, I think it was, in general, it was about kind of growing remote remote culture and a remote team and just what that looks like at scale when you kind of pass like, you know, three people, four people, five people, like, oh, double digits, like now it's a real thing. Like, how does this work? And I think I, I just remember you very vividly from that talk being like, ooh, like I got to keep this in my bookmarks and like put a repeating task to watch this every month so I can really like <laughs> dig into it. But uh, tell us a little bit about Deprix, like uh, how to get started and what is it now? Yeah, absolutely. So we started late in 2010, actually a little bit earlier uh, through freelancing and stuff like that. But let's say end of 2010, uh, I started with uh, my, I'm going to say co-founder simply because he's been so hipster that he started even before the company was founded. <laughs> uh, so we kind of started working together. Uh, he's currently our CTO, Stanko. So we've been together since day one. Basically, we started with all sorts of development and also technical trainings and all that jazz. And just two or three, maybe a couple of years later, we completely switched entirely to WordPress and decided to only focus on the WordPress, uh, you know, core framework. That's what I'm going to say. So you started uh, out, so, and it was not it was not just WordPress. You were doing a few different you were doing a few different places, and then you decided at some point to just just do WordPress. Yeah, precisely. Actually, the name Devrix itself 
comes from two words, development and BRICS. And essentially, we wanted to really kind of imply that development is a very thoughtful process, an analytical one that requires different pieces and you need to, to put the different pieces together in a very smart and sane way, in a zen way, so that they don't really collide with one another. You need to build a stable framework, a structure, an environment, whatever you want to call it, a foundation to build upon. And that's kind of uh, how the name came in. My background is actually in enterprise development, mostly through Java, but other mm-hmm. programming languages as well. So I came from the enterprise world and kind of many of the projects that came in as a freelance developer actually were PHP projects. So, you know, eventually we were working on different PHP gigs, also other types of gigs, mobile development and desktop and whatnot, even set-top boxes, you know, before smart TVs, smart TVs were actually a thing. So at some point, we just decided to kind of focus on one thing and WordPress was the, the thing to go. And right now we are a team of, uh, I think, 40 plus people. We do have a nice fancy office here in Bulgaria with uh, nearly half of the people, I would say, even though, again, we have some people working from home uh, here too. But mm-hmm. let's say it's currently it's kind of 50-50. Previously, it was more like 30 local, 70 remote or so, but, but right now we are more like 50-50, even though we are not really abandoning the remote lifestyle. We just have uh, a bunch of different projects that require a lot of day-to-day. Uh, they're pretty intense. It's more like uh, on a maintenance basis, you're going to relate to this one. So. Uh, Communication is simply more paramount, which is why we kind of brought uh, in some people locally in order to help us scale even further. Yeah, very cool. I'm I'm on devrix.com right now, and I I love the homepage. Just I love how the team is really at the forefront. Like on the homepage, you land there. Like here's our team. These are some people. Some of the people on our team. These are the the real people that make up our company. You'll be working with. I, we've tried to do, go a similar route. If you go into wpbuffs.com, and kind of have the people mm-hmm. in the background who are you know really powering the company. So I like that. It says a lot. And very interesting that you kind of come from an enterprise background. Do you find most of your your clients are, are more in kind of the large business and enterprise space? Because I think there's a big difference between the work being done in kind of large business enterprise space and then kind of more the works that WP Buffs does, which is more entrepreneur, small business. Like we're just not set up very well to do enterprise work because we our systems are have created and the business model is such that we work, you know, on, you know, anywhere from $50 a month to $400 a month, you know, care plans, whereas you guys may be a little more expensive, but it may be kind of in the enterprise space. Is that kind of where you're focused on mostly? And and what does that look like in terms of like systems for enterprise? It must be, it must be at least somewhat complex. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question, or I would say a wonderful set of questions. Essentially, you're right. We are definitely focusing, I would say, on the enterprise or at least high scale projects. Our three mm-hmm. main targets are medium enterprises and some well-known top brands. Uh, High-scale publishers, we do have some publishers scaling hundreds of millions of pages a month, and this is one of our specialties. Uh, Also, uh, funded startups, especially those who specialize in software and service. We are actually one of the very, very first uh, WordPress businesses who have been building SaaS applications back in, I think, 2012 or so. So we launched several SaaS apps back then, and this was a huge win. It's getting even better and even easier to launch software and service applications on top of WordPress, so this is also a target of ours. But essentially, we are working with larger businesses, we are working with complex code bases, and we really enjoy solving challenging problems for our customers. We're talking performance issues, stability, scalability, API integration, different architecture programs, integrating you know, all sort of complex jobs that we can come up with. Basically, that's what our people enjoy doing. So this is kind of a nice collaboration between our staff and people who are in need of, of that kind of complex know-how, so to speak. And we found our way the kind of enterprise needs WordPress. And this specific niche of this tiny percentage of clients using WordPress as a robust platform or those who have scaled to a certain point and they can't really find someone who can take them to the next level. And that's when they actually call it. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. Uh, I it, no matter what you know market you're sol- you're you're trying to solve problems for, it's still important to have your kind of niche. So like we're just working with large businesses and enterprise 
customers or clients is still a huge area. So I like the fact that you're all you're working with this huge, you know, client base or this huge audience, you still have very kind of specific criteria for the kind of people who you're ideal for, because then you can really focus your marketing a little better and your sales just to, to say, hey, like, this is what we do. You know, we're the best in the world at this thing. And so mm-hmm. if you want to do this thing, come to us to help. It's cool that this, uh, you know, working with these high traffic publishers, I mean, that's something I want to dig into a little bit, you know, millions of page views a month. What does a project like that usually entail to make sure that a website that's getting that much traffic that you don't have, you know, a hundred thousand out of those million visitors having a slower experience because the the host is not able to, to carry as much, or it's just you, what are the things you're kind of scaling to like, make sure that, that people who are getting that much traffic are really delivering the prime and premium experience to every single website visitor? Right. So there are lots of different possible cases to use soft performance for high traffic publishers. I am going to use the most complex bunch of them, and those are the viral publishers. You know, viral viral publishers generally try to get as much traffic as possible to their websites, and the trickiest bit is they're actually running tons of ads. And with tons of ads, it's extremely challenging to make something work and scale through time, especially if you have video players popping up and refreshing here and there, and sticky units popping up at the bottom of the bar for mobile devices within, say, Facebook or Snapchat or whatnot. And this is really making things more complex on a whole other level. So aside from the traditional best practices for you know, an incredible hosting environment, different sure. caching layers, CDNs, optimizing images, there's the other complexity of scaling specific... Well, it's kind of a complexity and a benefit. So those publishers are pushing tons of traffic. Again, probably two of uh, those viral publishers have hundreds of millions of pages a month. So we're talking about daily traffic of you know, 20 million or so people hitting the site on a, any single day, right? Daily uh, traffic, the, the, daily traffic of daily 20 traffic, million, yeah. you said. Wow, yeah, that's, like, <laughs> so, that's heavy duty. Yeah. One of the publishers that we used to work with, they had uh, 950 million pages in March. So Ooh. it's pretty much uh, less than 50 million page views uh, shy from a billion, right? So that, that's kind of the type of traffic that we're working on. So the trickier bit is actually managing ads in a reasonable manner so that they're both profitable, which is a you know, tricky science on itself. So we have mm, yeah. people specializing in ad operations right now and other things. And, and also making this whole experience bearable for different devices and different people scrolling through uh, different sorts of income channels, such as, again, Facebook or Snapchat or Taboo or some other, like maybe Yahoo, maybe uh, whatnot. Uh, so then we need to implement different sort of solutions like custom lazy loading or infinite scrolls so that different chunks are loaded at the time or even destroying former units and former images from previous slides just to allocate buffers for the coming sections of the page that are going to pop up. So that's where it gets a little bit more interesting and that's kind of what it takes most of our time just to be squeezing the most out of performance because even a you know, five millisecond delay when you account for those 20 million people who are going to hit the site now, that's really adding up very quick. Yeah, yeah. This is very interesting to, to talk about also coming from my perspective because we do performance optimization, but on a, uh, a client that's paying $400 a month, it makes it much more difficult to do everything necessary for performance optimization. That being said, someone who's paying $400 a month is not going to be you know, nearly at the level of someone who a five, second milli- or a five millisecond difference is going to mean you know, 500000 more dollars or less dollars. But that's probably one of the toughest pieces of our business is the performance optimization at a lower budget. Um, I think that there's, there's, as you know very well, performance uh, optimization is a huge task. Um, and to, to it's, it's not too difficult to get to like 80% optimized. Like you can, you know, be a pretty basic technician and, you know, follow the waterfall and make sure, you know, that, that you know, uh, DT metrics gives you and, and get probably 80% of the way there. But to get from 80 to 90 is a big jump. And then to get from 90 to 99 is just, I mean, that takes really daily work. And most likely it's going to be, a, you know, a team of people doing that. But it sounds like you guys have, uh, have kind of built out the resources to have a team doing that kind of stuff for a client that knows that, the investing in the the infrastructure and the team to help do that is actually providing a, a pretty big ROI because if the website's fast or the application's fast, people are enjoying themselves. People are having good experience. They're more likely to view ads or check out or whatever the money making KPI is. 
Exactly, and and it's getting even more complicated to be honest. Because let's say that let's say that you're running I don't know uh, page speed or GT metrics or something else, and you check out the site and say, oh wow, this has you know 140 uh, HTTP requests, right? And you say, wow, that's a lot. We can bring it down to eight or so. Like let let's say that this is one challenge by itself, and then you go to a publisher website who has a quiz of the hundred. I don't know, 100 questions for the most popular Marvel characters. Let's just say as an example. So you have 100 questions, imagine insanely long quiz or, uh, you know, very long article or a gallery or something like that is going to show up in its entirety, right? So you have 100 images. So there you go, 100 requests on its own. Then you have a couple of video players, each of those players sending 300 requests by itself and then refreshing every, I don't know, five or 10 questions or so and then adding another 300 requests to the entire browser experience, right? So those are some of the challenges we're, that we're dealing with. And you can't just go to the cloud and say, hey man, uh, you need to remove your player. And say, are you crazy? This is bringing like 30% of my revenue. And you say, well, bummer, right? <laughs> this isn't really an experience that you're going to do. So what I'm trying to say is this is kind of one specific challenge that you need to work around all those limitations and all those things that you can't really get rid of simply because this is the money-making machine. Or on the other end, you know, uh, clients need to iterate really quickly. You need to allow them to do some, I don't know, custom editing or some other stuff. And then again, you need to find the balance between something that's more or less adjustable and customizable, but then not too much because you need to keep performance top of mind as well. So this fine balance by itself is really occupying a good chunk of our time for those high traffic publishers. Yeah, I mean, that totally resonates with me. I think one of the hardest parts about performance optimization is it's not always just the the technical aspect of making a website faster. It's the whole conversation around what can we change on the website in order to make it faster. And I think if I'm being honest, that's probably one of the challenges we have is how do we communicate well with our clients at a lower budget to do performance optimization because you have to have these meetings and these conversations with people like what can we remove? What can't we remove? Like, you know, if something's causing, you know, a half second loading issue, but that's a huge, that adds a ton of functionality to the website. You obviously can't take it out or, or it's a, it's important for that website to make money. You obviously can't remove it. So you have to have that conversation about, okay, like we can't, can we remove this or not? Like how much does it impact you? Oh, it impacts you a lot. So, okay. Now how can we optimize that based on your server setup, based on other plugins, theme you're using all this stuff, but yeah. Super interesting. So it sounds like you have teams in place to handle all of this. One of the other things you have kind of listed here in the show notes I'm looking at is you guys have a, an R&D team um, or you're, it's, it looks like you're, it says building. So building an R&D team uh, for ongoing success across portfolio clients. There are a lot of big agencies in the WordPress space that, that work on you know enterprise, medium to large businesses. But I haven't heard very much about people having a specific team for research and development. I always say like, and I know that listeners here, there are a lot of WordPress professionals listening to the show who would totally be interested in this, but I just selfishly just want to hear it for myself. Like what's up with the, the R&D team? What was the impetus behind that? Tell us a little bit more about what's going on there. So here's what's going on. And I'm actually going to give an example with your business. How many clients do you have right now? I read the annual report, but I just forgot the number of projects. So websites manage were just over 400 uh, clients. I, right. that, that probably makes to 250 to, to or so clients. Some people have multiple websites or white label clients have multiple. So, but 400 that, plus. That's, that's, fine. Mm-hmm. that's fine. So let, let me make an example out of it. You have 400 websites that you're managing right now. And let's say that you sit down and you suddenly realize that 40 of your clients, for example, are e-commerce, right? So this is about... Uh, 10% of your websites are e-commerce and they happen to like 80 or 90% are going to be WooCommerce clients, right? So this uh, adds up to about 30 clients for WooCommerce. And let's say that they're paying, I don't know, 100 bucks a month or so. So this is, uh, what do you have? 30 clients, 100 bucks a month. You have, you know, uh, $3,000 a month that they invest in your services, right? So what if you allocate half of those money, like uh, 1500 what do you, what if you allocate them and actually hire you know half time person or whatever it is and say let's figure out what are the the kind of most crucial pain points of those customers and try to build them across the board of those clients right so effectively what you do with an R and D department especially if you niche down enough to to either have a large portfolio portfolio of clients just as you have in a maintenance business or several specific verticals you're working with, then you sit down and say, okay, let's 
kind of hypothetically allocate 20, 30, 40%, whatever it is from the monthly revenue coming from those customers. And let's figure out what we can make if we, if we combine this effort. You know, instead of working in chunks for every uh, client of ours, we allocate those resources combined because they are for the same niche of customers, the same group of customers facing the same major pain points and what we can do to make it even better, right? So this is just another mentality. This is just another way to look at the problems. Of course, it's not necessary to do it, but when you do it, you can actually have an R&D department that both solves the problems of your client and also help you improve your tooling or build additional monitoring systems, analytic systems, big data, machine learning, stuff that actually helps you get more insightful knowledge and make better decision-making and improves your deployments and everything else that kind of comes in. So that's essentially what the R&D department is all, uh, it's all about. Right now, we do have three people in our R&D department. So what they basically do is we do have weekly meetings. We uh, try to analyze what is the course of events and kind of what are the main challenges. Are we still on track? Do we have some progress here that we can leverage in our other meetings? Things like that. And then we take that knowledge, we gather together, discuss some stuff, plan for additional iterations for things that could benefit all of our customers within that specific vertical, and iterate in a pretty lean, agile manner. Very cool, man. I love the idea of as you're growing and gathering new clients and you're kind of grouping them into areas, you can be far more efficient trying to pool the pain points of 40 customers as opposed to one or two and building a solution that can work across all of them. I think a lot of people hear the term R&D department and they think, wow, like what, uh, like, like that's a money pit, like how expensive must it be to have an R&D department? But I actually, and completely based on what you said, right? It's not at all. In fact, in a, in a lot of cases, if you do it correctly, it's actually the opposite because you're solving problems for multiple clients who will pay you for the same solution across all those clients, but you're not just creating a custom solution for all of them. You're actually kind of doing it in a much more scalable way. So I love that idea, man. I think that that's something I may steal something, you know, steal some ideas from that coming through this year. It's not on our roadmap yet, but that's something that I just kind of wrote down. I just typed it out in my kind of little personal notebook saying, hey, later this year, let's think about like what that looks like. Um, because I think for businesses, if, you, if you're running a business and you want that business to, to grow and to scale, you have to find ways to make it scalable and make it easier on yourself. And to me, this is a very it's a very good place to put an investment because you're, fi- you're, you're making the whole system a little bit more scalable so you can provide solutions to, to, across multiple clients, but kind of do the put in the time and the resources and the financial load into kind of one solution, but that one solution will provide it will will help multiple clients. So very cool. Exactly. Is it, uh, and 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 yeah. actually if you if it if you take a look at this entire model, it makes a lot of sense for pretty much everyone because at the end of the day, you are charging fewer hours per customer because you're effectively splitting you know the amount of R and D across customers. So they're extremely happy because they get something massive you know, super spectacular, incredible, awesome thing that you built for, let's say, I don't know, 500 hours and you split it across five clients for 100 hours each, right? So they say, wow, I just got pretty much 500 hours worth of work for just 100 hours, right? It's just like what you do with premium points, right? You you only charge right. 20, 30, 50 bucks, but you know how much it costs to actually build an effective uh, premium point. So it's a similar mindset. So customers are happy. Uh, you may distribute your resources in a much saner manner. And more importantly, when you have similar problems, and if you can provide a library, a framework, a toolkit, a tool or a system that works across all of them, you're effectively reducing your QA efforts or maintenance efforts and everything else because you're maintaining the same solution across all of your clients. So again, this is another important note, and this is one of the reasons why we're niching down. Again, we started as a more or less generic technical agency, then we niche down to WordPress. Now we're niching down to specific verticals because this helps us accomplish the second most important thing. Well, not the second, but the other most important thing for the business, which is providing ongoing retainers, which also include the business consulting element. So effectively, the reason, the difference between the services that you offer, the maintenance services for uh, more or less smaller clients who can't afford the, the big plans, and our retainers that, you know, in theory, they seem really similar. The only difference is that we're investing in all this R&D, 
and we have the ability to to pull real data, real world data, and then advise on this data and on workflows and approaches and everything else, right? So the entire management consulting and operations consulting bit is what we take from all this equation. And this is what actually helps us really contribute to the bottom line of uh, enterprise grade performance. Yeah, I think that the if I've 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 thought on multiple occasions about what it looks like for WP Buffs to move up market, uh, and I don't know how well positioned we are for that because we've just again everything we've done has been based on like helping the little guy with their website, but and you know and at the end of the day it may be a separate company that does that, but I love the idea. I think most of the things you're saying are things that really resonate with me in terms of things I've thought about. Like, what would it look like if WP Buffs, like, what does enterprise level maintenance look like? Well, it may not even be called maintenance. It's probably called something more like a retainer. Um, and it's probably something where people are investing not just for their website to be maintained, but they're investing on an ongoing basis, on a monthly basis, in order to push their website forward constantly. Uh, and I think mm-hmm. that's the kind of result that, that uh, you know, People are somewhat looking for what in what we do, but definitely they're looking for that ROI in terms of like large businesses and enterprise. You know, they want to they want to pay, and a lot of times the price is not you know the the difference between ten thousand dollars a month and twenty five thousand dollars a month. It doesn't always isn't always that big for an enterprise level. They just want the result. They just want it to get done. And if you can if you can figure out how to to ha- be high impact to them in a scalable way for your own business, like it sounds like exactly what you're doing, then you can be in a really good place. Retainers is something yeah, else that we have on the 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 list of things you wanted to to talk about. What does a retainer generally look like for like an enterprise level client or like I guess you don't have to go exactly into that that single client that you were mentioning that does almost a billion either users or a billion page views a month. What does a retainer look like for someone who's just at that size and that scale? So there are different ways to to arrange all that. And this is actually one of the main things that we've been discussing internally over the past couple of uh, months. Essentially, what it, uh, what all this is about is figuring out a way to, to, to contribute to the bottom line of that specific customer. Or what I'm trying to say here is different customers, and all of them may be uh, from the startups or publishers or enterprise or anything else that we kind of uh, try to, to focus on, but they have different roadmaps and different sorts of, of kind of growth strategies. So we're trying to be adaptive to all of that, right? We do have internal workflows and it's really hard to get outside of those workflows if we want to be effective, right? We don't want to customize way too much because it's getting harder to handle management and QA and, and meetings and all that you know, all this stuff that happens with a larger company. But effectively, we are trying to figure out models that are profit, still profitable and can contribute to a specific business, right? So for kind of our traditional package is we analyze the business, we analyze what they're after, we analyze their traffic or rough revenue, like we're trying to gouge at least a rough number. And then we say, okay, what we think uh, is going to, like we are going to try with a more or less three-month plan just to gouge and, and, and kind of test the waters and figure out what a, a profitable collaboration is going to look like, right? So we are going to start with this one. And then we, you know, it's, it's kind of a limitless contract, right? It's going to expand in the very same manner if everything goes to the plan. But otherwise, month two or month three, if there are communication problems, if, you know, all the tasks are way too easy, if, if the pace is actually slow, so they want to move faster, then we're probably going to adjust it one way or another. We are going to bump up the monthly hours, we are going to allocate some on half time working on this project or or something else. So we uh, more or less we are starting with the agreement that the first two three months are going to be just trying to make the communication work in the long run, and then the next two three four whatever it is years, then we are going to find a profitable way to start supporting the ROI of the business. And this may be through a traditional fixed hourly uh, monthly plan or kind of a minimum cap and then adding additional resources for different things or kind of a hybrid combination of someone who's semi-dedicated and then having other resources helping out in different manner. I guess you can go kind of two ways. You can have a retainer which uh, says, here's how much you know you would pay us per month and here's how many hours that equates to. So this is the amount of hours that we're going to hit in this month. You could also do it by saying, here's a thing you need done. We're going to dedicate hours to it. And then I guess we're going to invoice you at the end of the month, not knowing exactly how many hours you're going to have, but kind of being at a rough ballpark. Which method do you guys do? I guess those are both methodologies, but you guys do, which, yeah, which one do you guys go with? 
either the first one where we do have an agreement and then we can do the all the management, all the internal product planning. You basically become the the product owner internally, right? So we say, okay, having those resources and that manpower, this is what we can do. This is the long-term roadmap. This is how we are going to structure it, propose it to the plan, get the green light, and then work according to, to those plans. Of course, emergencies may happen, last-minute requests may happen, but more or less this is kind of a traditional way we are doing things. The other way is to, to go for a minimum plan so that people can book our a minimum power resources so that, again, we can just allocate people for them but have the opportunity to scale to a certain level. Like let's say they book 50 hours, but they have a way to go to 100 or even 120 if you know it's a successful month, usually with at least a week of, of prompt notice, right? So those are kind of the two possible ways. We try to avoid the idea of either ballpark of hours that we distribute over time or just a rough arrangement because we've had this problem before. We have a plan, with, for example, we are working for six, seven, eight, nine, 10 months, and then suddenly they almost disappear and they don't really respond to our change sets or they don't want to review change or whatever it is because they're busy. So two months pass by, they're back, but what should we invoice, right? They're not really happy with getting invoice for work not done. They're not really happy because we're pretty much pending changes and stuff. So this is a little bit tricky. So we try to commit to a certain number or a certain minimum of uh, hours slash price that we charge on a monthly basis. Yeah, I think with... with uh enterprise clients as and it's it's a somewhat similar with our client base but definitely with enterprise a lot of the uh work is just communication uh, i think at at enterprise level companies there're just a lot of moving pieces in that company just in the company who's the client of yours there's a lot of you know whose permission do you need to do x y and z uh and so i think that's one of the reasons i've actually been hesitant to even like think about the enterprise space is just because like i don't know if i want to do all that communication and try and like get through all that red and yellow tape it does have its benefits for sure but i'm sure it's also pretty tough have you guys encountered that that's been something you guys have had to kind of figure out is something you have to like dedicate certain team members that are almost just purely kind of i guess like project managers like communicate communicators is that something that's just kind of a role there at Debrex? Yeah, of course we do we actually do have like three project management uh, project managers right now we do have an account manager who's also acting as sales as needed uh we do have all the kind of senior management jumping in for all sorts of different scenarios and we also do have the so-called role project owner which is a role that we've defined for a technical lead who's uh, primarily interacting with the client alongside the project manager so more or less, communication is definitely an important step. It's definitely something that's a hard requirement for our customers. And essentially, this is why we are trying to build so many communication vectors in order to improve the whole process. And at the same time, we are trying to make the process clean or at least as much as possible. Like We do have, of course, a project management system. We do have Slack. Uh, and we try to document everything. We try to prepare monthly roadmaps. We try to, you know gather hourly reports and all other sorts of kind of uh, priority lists and everything else that needs to happen from our team. So it's a combined effort that happens on multiple fronts. And of course, we keep improving over and over and over again, but that's, uh, that's kind of how it goes. But to be completely honest, for enterprises, it's mostly the, the startups, especially the funded startups that are moving really fast. With right. enterprises, it's usually the, the paperwork overhead, uh, many, many, many layers of management in different pieces, in different places, getting a sign off on a yes, no email in two weeks and, and things like that. Uh, lack of access to different systems, two factor authentications going through someone's phone number, internal VPNs working only on Internet Explorer 9. That kind of stuff is actually the problem with enterprise, uh, essentially. It's not really the, the hectic timelines and whatnot. It's mostly this tedious process that Again, most of your time actually goes into communication and trying to find workarounds and not really doing the work that you're hired to do. Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, that Internet Explorer thing hits a little too close to home for me. I've done uh, I before I did WP Buffs. I was a government consultant uh, here in DC, and oof, I used Internet Explorer a lot because no other, nothing else worked. So I, I get that. You know yeah, exactly. Um, cool. One thing you kind of mentioned was um, talking about sales for enterprise. I'd love to dig into that a little bit and what that 
looks like in terms of um, you know bringing on new clients in the first place. I think for what WP Buffs does, we do a lot of uh, a lot of our marketing's inbound. Uh, as listeners know, I've talked about it you know multiple times here on the show. But uh, a lot of people coming, reading our blog, joining our email list, and then kind of getting dripped into our sales sequence if they're interested. And we provide the education, and then they kind of make the decision: Do I want you know a care plan for my website? Do I want to join the white label program and have uh, have uh, uh, you know WP Buffs manage my clients for me? Inbound may be a little easier for people you know who are at our price range. I'm not sure what sales looks like on an enterprise level. Or is the is a VP kind of finding your website and saying like, oh, I'm going to contact these guys, or is it more you know people uh, heads of the company kind of reaching out and doing relationship building with people over 12 months or so to really start to bring them on board? Yeah, what does that look like? Right, that's an excellent question. Um, I actually gave a talk about this in WordCamp Bucharest, and I think next week we are going to have the video up on WordPress TV, or at least I hope so. So I'm happy to share a link for the listeners so that they can actually check this out because, again, it's a 25 or 30 minute talk that we simply cannot really fit into this one here, uh, unfortunately. But but the bottom line is we do love inbound and we actually use inbound and for the most part, it also works for us. We are actually a HubSpot agency partner. And again, we are pretty much following their methodology and everything else. And this is Again, since we are also providing consulting to our customers, the HubSpot and the inbound way is one of the pieces that we're also contributing as a part of our retainer offering, right? But it's a little bit trickier with enterprises. It is feasible for things that you can easily measure or things that make sense for your revenue and don't really make you, uh, you know, completely afraid of this or hesitant or anxious to, to actually reach out. And there's also the other problem that you don't, like if you're an enterprise organization, you can't really afford, well, not that you can't afford, but it's a bit trickier to, to be hesitant about pricing. What I'm trying to say is you can't say, oh, you're very expensive and just go away because this is definitely going to impact your corporate brand, which is going to cost you a small fortune. And now this is something that's really problematic. So inbound works for us. We actually do have, I would say, maybe four channels right now. Inbound marketing for our blog is definitely one of them. Strategic partnerships are super crucial, extremely important for us. I'm talking about partnerships with other businesses working with enterprise clients or publishers or so forth so that we can exchange leads and work together for us, uh, for the same client. My own personal brand is, is helping out a lot. Lots of people find the business through me, through my work online. Uh, and also guest posts, case studies, and, and other Things that we've done that go live on, on various sources, such as uh, Forbes, Inc., Entrepreneur, and, and some others online. So those are kind of the four main channels. We don't do traditional outbound support, uh, even though we do paid advertising, going to some blog posts of ours or landing pages, then we do retargeting, then we do even more retargeting, and we're going to try to move them further down the funnel. What the difference with enterprises is there is a study, I believe, from Microsoft. They said that a customer should... Uh, have a touch point with your brand between seven and 13 times before they actually reach out or are comfortable closing a deal. By touch point, I mean reading your blog, uh, finding you on social media, reading an email, webinar, everything and anything. You know, they just, you need to be on top of mind. And when they're ready, they are going to make the, the, the move. But it simply doesn't happen with one single move or one single vertical or uh, even one single channel. You need to be omni channel so that. Everyone, like they, they just see you everyone and say, okay, like I'm, I'm already convinced. I, I read two, three, five, ten things that are super exciting. Love the business. I see them everywhere. I see them contributing. I see them growing. I see them. They're real people. So, you know, I'm just going to reach out whenever the time comes. So Dude, that's more or less how, how it kind of goes. I, yo, I love everything you just said. The, the, we just brought in Kaylin. So Kaylin's a new head of marketing and she's handling all our social activity. And I was a, uh, I was a little bit skeptical of putting more effort into social. Cause I was kind of like, where's the ROI there? Like, I don't know. Like, you know, you tweet a few more times, a few people more see your stuff, but I am very much coming around and starting to realize that exactly what you're saying, this omni channel approach is like, people have to see you a certain amount of times before they eventually come and work with you. And I think everybody who sees you or interacts with you, I think of everybody as a put, as a potential lead either right now or way in the future. It doesn't mean they have to work with you right now, but when they're ready to work with you, you need to be top of mind. So when they've seen you on social, even if they've just seen a tweet or you know, a post on Facebook, that is one more time they've seen you and you've become top of mind one more time. So I'm not sure if it's, you know, social is the best investment for someone who's really just starting out depending on their business. But 
I, at some point you like the, um, the, the, that, that word you just use, like Omni, Omni focus was, I think is Omni channel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Omni channel. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Is that's perfect. And also interesting to hear that we, WP buffs kind of works in similar fashion in terms of like our channels, definitely inbound through the blog is a big one. Um, strategic partnerships is something we're trying to, it's something that's been very successful for us so far, but it's kind of been a little bit informal if I'm being honest. And I think this year is a big year where we're trying to like put a little bit, not too much formality, but just like, here's how we need to work together so that this, we get this one plus one equals three action. Like our company does well, your company does well. The customers get two awesome solutions. I mean, nothing could be better than that. So I love that idea. And I think that is a very underutilized channel for a lot of people starting off and kind of trying to grow their business there. You don't have to be working or partnering with the biggest customers are the biggest partners in the world. Like we reached out to um, SiteGround about a partnership. And this was probably like a year ago, you know, when we were smaller and they obviously saw us as kind of a small fish. And then we saw that they announced a partnership with Codable. And I was like, okay, like, of course that makes sense. Like I wasn't mad or anything, but like, of course it makes sense. Codable is is, is at at a scale that makes sense to work with the SiteGround. So it makes sense depending on where you are to to a strategic partnership with someone who's kind of at your level and you can kind of grow together as opposed to trying to reach out to just the big fish. You know, you guys can partner with a big fish because you are a big fish, but you know, a medium or small fish, there's no problem with being a medium or small fish, but you want to gather with your crew to try and, you know, maybe become a bigger fish, I think. So I love that strategic partnership uh, mention. That's great. Yeah, well, trust me, it's tricky because most of the businesses that we're actually working with, most of the vendors, they are actually companies with 1,500 people. And now... <laughs> that's a completely different conversation. So like talking yeah. to fish outside of WordPress, then like, again, that's a completely different deal. And mentioning site ground is actually a good idea. Last time I checked, there were like 700 people and yeah. we we're like 40 plus. And, you know, like, <laughs> even though we've actually worked, like they, they are local, their office is like, uh, I don't know, three miles away right. from here. Uh, we have worked with them for a couple of years or so. So, you know, this is another type of way to do a, a partnership. But again, what you're saying makes sense. You've, like being able to work with uh, comparable uh, value offerings is really important. So that's why when you keep scaling, you actually unlock different opportunities. And some other people are also trying to reach out to you. And it's not really a super great deal for you unless they make an extra push to make it a great deal. Right. So sometimes it's unfair, but unfortunately, that's what business is. Totally. And and maybe even I'd amend what I would say a little bit, actually pulling in something else you said about enterprise sales, which is it doesn't always happen quickly. A lot of times with enterprise, it takes a while to build those relationships. It's going to be the same with the strategic partnership. So a company of you know, 40, 50 people can work with a company that's of 700 people. Of course, that's possible. I didn't want to, you know, listeners to think like you shouldn't want to do that, but you shouldn't expect that you're just going to send one email and it's just going to happen, right? You're going to have to talk with a few people on their team over a couple months and then you go to WordCamp Europe because the SiteGround team is there. And then you go and hang out with yeah. people. They get to know you. And this is the process of really creating strategic partnerships, especially with bigger partners or partners who are a little bigger than you are. You have to get to know them. You have to have multiple touch points. Like you said, that seven to 13 touch points, it's not just for sales. I think a lot of times it's for if you want to have a great strategic partnership, you have to put in the time and effort for that as well. And the, yep. the personal brand thing is cool too. So you're speaking at, at word camps and maybe attending some other conferences and people are kind of finding Devrix through, hey, that guy just gave a great talk. I should check out his company. So for our type of business, word camps aren't working at all. Uh, to be completely honest, I know of very few companies that uh, manage to land bigger plans through word camps. It's really rare. It's extremely rare, even though like the past one or two years, there's a little bit of movement in in the market. Like other types of industries are trying to come to larger work camps just to see what it's all about. And then you can potentially schedule some meetings. Like this time for WordCamp Europe, I wasn't able to to go myself, but we had like five or six strategic meetings with prospects there simply because it's large enough and they also want to talk to different vendors. But Mm -hmm. for the most part, this isn't really a great uh, place to go. It's either niche-related or an industry-related or a community-related or... Or, or something uh, around those lines. And most of my branding nowadays, it's really, uh, you know, writing content for YC, for example, which gets published on Forbes Ring, uh, writing on Quora, which gets republished to, again, other sources, having a kind of contributor account to entrepreneur.com and some other places, which really uh, kind of helps out and providing also some other services that help use uh, kind of work as a lead generation, like consulting services on Clarity, for example, it helps out. Sometimes people call in for 30 minutes and they say, wow, you sold me, I'm convinced. Thanks for helping me out. And I pretty much believe that we can do a long-term deal that helps our digital effort. So 
those, again, talking about omnichannel approach, I'm a great fan, fan of inbound, which is why I'm writing a lot. I'm a great fan of repurposing content. I have a bunch of different videos on YouTube for all of those things as well. So again, just trying to cover as many channels, stay top of mind, and this is really helping out, especially if you do it in a smart way, which uh, is what I'm trying to do with like 12 hours uh, uh, a week. I'm recording a couple of videos, guest posts, other posts. Uh, and several other things, to, uh, you know, just back and forth through a very focused, strategic, planned effort, which goes on the channel at the end of the day. Yeah, I love the I love that idea of you have to know where to go to get your clients and WordCamps is a great that's a great recruiting ground for us both for you know, like not just for customers and potential partners and clients, but also for uh, like hiring. But you guys do enterprise and enterprise is a really different ball game. And I'd be hard pressed to see a lot of enterprise people at WordCamps. Maybe the enterprise people are at like the WordCamp Europe or the WordCamp US. But I think going and and finding where your customers and cl- potential clients are, uh, whether it's online or in person, you have to go there, you have to be there, um, you have to be present, you have to be helpful. Um, so Mario, dude, this has been real. Thank you for hopping on with me. This has been really cool. I've learned a lot about enterprise level, uh, delivering WordPress at an enterprise level. Usually I like to, I'd like to finish off, just uh, have you tell people where they can find you online, Twitter or website, whatever you want. Yeah, excellent. Uh, thanks, Joe. It was definitely a pleasure for me as well. Always love chatting, you know, enterprise work and retainers, also recurring to revenues and ideas that people can utilize and uh, actually apply at their own work. Uh, people can find me on mariopressure.com. This is my own personal website. It has uh, links to different places that I publish content or produce or whatnot. And in, you know, in terms of chats or some kind of, again, uh, more real-time communication, I'm primarily using LinkedIn, Twitter, and Quora. So again, whoever's interested, look up Mario Pesha from the, all those three channels or go to mariopesha.com and uh, get in touch. Very cool, man. I just went to it right now. I'm surfing it. It looks awesome. I love I love the the range of different places you've kind of been published in or featured in. I mean, all the the places you would think that en- that enterprise level people are reading. So yeah, it makes sense and resonates exactly with what you just said. Cool, man. So we end the show. We usually like to ask people give us a quick little review on iTunes. Uh, a five star review goes very far. It helps us get found in the iTunes store. Especially if you were like, whoa, like I learned a lot from Mario. He's the man. And man, this was a crazy awesome episode. Leave a review and in the comment, just say like, hey, Mario, thanks for hopping on. That was great. Uh, And we'll be sure to forward it to him so he can have a little smile one day and say, hey, this episode was awesome. Um, (laughs) All right, guys, do it, do it. There you go. (laughs) If you have questions for the show, email it in to yo at WPMRR.com. Also, I guess if you have questions for Mario, you can shoot them into us. We'll forward them to him. Maybe he'll answer and get you some, some replies there. He seems like he's very, Mario, you seem like you're very, you know, you do a lot of stuff online. So I think you're very community oriented. So I would, I think he'll definitely get back to you if you have a question for us. Um, other than that, oh, we, yeah, yeah, cool. We are uh, wrapped up for this week. We will hear y'all next, or you will hear, he, will hear you. You will hear from us again next Tuesday. Mario, thanks again for coming on, man. It's been real. Thanks for having me and chat soon. If you have any questions, let me know. And yeah, have a good one. Don't forget to go to iTunes, pay review.